Hey, all you folks out there in the Nerd Herd, welcome back to Section 31, the Star Trek arm of the Nerd Network. We are joined on the bridge today by two of our favorite Starfleet officers in this side of the Alpha Quadrant. Jay, how are you doing tonight, sir? I am doing great. I cannot wait to talk about this episode. And for once, it's not because I have a list longer than my arm of complaints. <laughs> and uh, agreed. Our good science officer, Mr. John Velasco. How you doing, sir? Hey, good evening. And uh, hello to both of you. It, it was, again, a great episode, great week. Um, all of a sudden, I'm starting to think I'm going to be missing this show when it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm the Jake the Nerd. Uh, if you're new to a Nerd Network show, kind of stumbled upon us, what we like to do on a Nerd Talk show is we give you a little bit up top of non-spoiler thoughts, just to give you a taste of what our thoughts are. And if you haven't seen the content, go ahead and watch these. Hit pause, go over to Paramount Plus, watch it, and Spore Jump, Warp Jump, Transwork Conduit, I don't care. Come on back. And then we <laughs> will dive into the nerdy goodness with you. Uh, so guys, <laughs> let's talk non-spoiler thoughts. John... Give me 60 to 90 seconds on what your thoughts are on Whistle Speak, episode 6 of season 5 of Star Trek Discovery. I am super impressed that they've taken this, and it's become cliche now, but this Indiana Jones quest that is all encompassing and the most important thing in the world, as Jake hates and yet somehow managed to create an episode that was just beautiful and fun to watch. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this might have been the most Star Trek that Discovery has ever been. Yep. Agreed. I get it. I get it. I did like this episode. It felt a little odd to me as far as pacing in the overall season that we've gotten so far. But there are points of this I like. There's one particular point we'll talk about that I already mentioned to Jay that I'm like, that just made it Star Trek. Um, and then there's some other things that I thought were really cool that they finally mentioned certain things. They still have not acknowledged that Dr. Culper is not human. Mm. Like, come on. <laughs> Uh, they I pretty much the reason... said he was. I mean, they... I get I that. The reason is... But we watched the mushroom people from the other dimension rebuild his body. Gro is not a human. He is a growth mm. of fungus. <laughs> I think that might be... We might be looking at a situation where it's kind of like um, when the Borg nanites rebuild tissue because that part of a Borg is meant to be organic and so in when they when the board gets injured the nanites literally gather raw material from around them and create living cells and go we will replace your cells now as happily as they will be like oh look your optical sensor that was installed in you is damaged i will make some circuitry here and i think maybe what we're looking at is a situation where the spore consciousness, whatever it was, smart matter replicated human tissue to rebuild him and then handed him over. And there's probably after, like there's probably at some level, some way to detect that change if you have the right tech, mm -hmm. but that from any other appearance, we're looking at a replica of his body with his consciousness restored into it. Oh yeah. And I'm fully aware that it's Star Trek science and it's a human. Well, although but he will forever be the ever mushroom since man. You, ever since you first said that, I keep going back to that uh, scene with Stamets in the uh, in the engineering saying that uh, if you stay in this room any longer, you, you'll start growing mushrooms in your lungs. And now the only thing I can think is that Culver needed to poke his head out of a from out of a door and say, like me, and then disappear <laughs> just as quickly as he came. Yeah, yeah. I That's I agree. Be in my head for a while. Um <laughs> guys, are you ready for spoilers? 
Uh, absolutely. Yes. Awesome. Well, we're going to dive into spoilers. If you're new to Nerd Talk or the Nerd Network or Section 31 in general, go ahead and hit like and subscribe down at the bottom. We would love for you to hang around, be part of our audience, and enjoy all the nerdy stuff we do. Leave a comment. Tell us what you thought of this episode. How Star Trekky was it? Uh, and what are your thoughts on the journey so far? Uh, and if you are a auditory listener only, we do have a podcast feed in our link tree in the description below. So be sure to check that out. But otherwise, here is your red alert for your spoiler alert. See you in a few. Hey there, thank you for choosing the Nerd Network for this piece of your content. We're excited to bring all this kind of content to you. So I'd like to stop for a moment and remind you to like this video, the YouTube will share it with all of your friends, subscribe to the channel and ring that notification bell so you know when we drop more nerdy content. If you're like me and you have a big interest in our biggest nerdy franchises out there, check out the Nerd Republic. That is our home for all the adventures in a galaxy far, far away with our Star Wars content. Take a look at Section 31, which if you like morals more than action adventure, that is our home for all of our Star Trek content. If you're like me and you love a good adventure with some superheroes, check out The Marvelous Nerds. It's where we locate all of our Marvel content. We also have our new brand, Ready Player Nerd, for all the gamers out there. Thank you for choosing the Nerd Network. Be sure to check out our channels, and then we'll get you right back to your content. All right, folks. We're here to talk about episode five in your spoiler section. I'm going to restart Pretty that. sure it's six. I Pretty sure there's six. 100%. Shut the fuck up. By the way, I'm going to make a quick... Uh, well, about I was going to ask. Yeah. Does anybody know? Uh, no, I don't. That's why I put John question mark. <laughs> it's like, I didn't direct this. Eh. <laughs> Uh, it right. was Chris Burns or somebody Burns. like yeah, that. He just, he just not, plugged that in. Yeah, it's not Frakes. I keep watching for Frakes. I wonder if he's going to get the series finale. He is. Yeah. Oh, I, is that, I saw is that the word? That the All right, that, let's let's that, continue. That, yeah. Because I, I keep altering my timestamp every time somebody talks. Talk. Okay. All right, welcome back to your spoiler section. If you're in this section, that means you have seen the unknown and are ready to go where no YouTuber has gone before. Well, probably about a thousand others, including Jesse Gender and Preview and a whole bunch of other channels, but we're going to talk about it too because we're super nerdy and we like Star Trek. Guys, what an episode. Directed by Chris Byrne, written by Kenneth Lynn, Brandon Schultz. Whistle Speak, the sixth episode of the final season of Star Trek Discovery. Just, um, just a quick note here. Um, Chris Byrne has directed five episodes of Discovery Now. Uh, one episode of Strange New Worlds. Also worked with Terry Metalis as a second unit director on 12 Monkeys. And uh, has worked on two other Brian Fuller created shows. So he he knows all the right people to be doing this. I think it okay. should. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, let's break down the plot. I have it set in two sections. Because there really wasn't a third section of the plot, at least to me. You guys can correct me. Uh, we're going to do plot B first. Aboard Discovery. I call it No Pressure. Save them. Um, Rainer and Adira on the bridge uh, attempting to figure out a fix to save uh, Tilly from, you know, being sacrificed to gods to create rain. And then Culper opening up to Hugh. Uh, Rainer gets to play captain again, and I still need... I still need the Rainer ship. Yeah. I would love for Rainer to be the captain of a starship assigned to Starfleet Academy until he's on it with her cadets. That's what I would love that show to be. So, by the way, you said Culber uh, opening up to Hugh is Hugh Culber. You know, I think you. we're just going to pretend I didn't say that. Yeah, it's okay. I think you were talking about Cleveland Booker, and that's fine. Was I talking about Cleveland Booker? Well, he opened up. He opens up a. He opens up and a Stamets. He, he opens up to Stamets and gets a very Stamets-y response. But I <laughs> very much want to talk about that because I want to honor his response, even though it's also very Stamets. Just um, gonna, just gonna change the did. word "opening up to" to "opening, opening up, up to people." To people. <laughs> yes, people. So, John, first thoughts on the B plot. I loved it. Um, as I said, I. I 
had mentioned to you already uh, that um, I, I really enjoy seeing Rainer uh, learn to become a member of the disco crew and and go way outside of his um, his comfort zone. And it showed this week, uh, but it also showed that he's getting more comfortable with it and he's learning. He did a fantastic job in a very Captain Raider style of getting Adira back on track. And then as he kind of turns to walk away, you see him giving himself a big smile like, look what I just did. Nailed <laughs> it. I, I am here for that. <laughs> I'm just going to say, I think that that was like a perfect blend of the Rainer who had been previously captaining and the Rainer who is learning from the Discovery crew because of that business of you said you wanted to be on the bridge so you're on the bridge done mm -hmm. along with wait I see what's going on and I wouldn't have put you and, here and if you were not capable and, and and I'm gonna give you the pep talk you need because that's my job right this minute. Right. Right? Especially in a more traditional, what we think of as Starfleet. Like we have to remember he is a burn era, different than Burnham, a burn era captain, which is a very, very different form of Starfleet version of Starfleet than we are used to. And no small part of Discovery's role in this era is to remind the Federation and Starfleet of what they really are, who they yes. are. And Rainer is kind of like we've seen that through the lens of Federation headquarters dispersed across a lot of characters in earlier seasons. But it is an interesting decision to put it all in one persona and have that one character go through all of that growth. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're seeing with Rainer is oh, yeah. the, oh, this is what we are. I forgot. Of course, he never really knew, but it's that sense of the collective, we forgot who we are. And here's Burnham and crew. Perhaps part of the reason this season is working so well is by pulling it down to one character I think it was hard to tell the narrative of Discovery is here to remind us of who we are. Right? Mm -hmm. Because she didn't go the Discovery crew, the she of the Discovery and her crew didn't go through the trauma we went through. Right? right? And to, I think, maybe part of the reason the season's working so well and why we keep talking about Rainer is that collapsing of that very dispersed story into a singular character. Star Trek has always been an ensemble, but small, small group of character story mechanism. And I think it might've been very hard to tell the story with all of Federation HQ. Uh, well, and I think it's, it's, Rainer is obviously an intricate component and the whole fish out of water is such a big part of the plot this season. But it really makes me wish we had had him back in season three when they first got there. Agreed. I was going to say yeah. the same thing. It would have made but, the transition to the 32nd century so much more interesting. Yes, I agree. And I think this goes back to this business about, I think they were always trying to tell this kind of story. But I think the writer's room that was there at season three didn't understand that the way Star Trek tells that story is to pick one character to represent that group, mm -hmm. right? If you are telling the business about how do the Klingons be Klingon while also moving forward into the 24th century and being able to get along with the other races, we see this primarily through war, mm -hmm. right? Um, because we, obviously we see the, the how do you be, how do you discover your humanity Every season has their Spock and their data, and we've talked on previous episodes about, I think it's Quark in Deep Space Nine, right? We've got the Doctor and Seven in Voyager, right? The da 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 But that concept of, I'm going to collapse this big, big concept into one persona is a Star Trekism. 
Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you're right. I agree. We should, the a writer's room that knew how to Star Trek, I think, would have either started the season off because we all three season three was basically a new series almost, right? They all they threw right. out the Bible for the show and started over. So maybe season three would have still started the way first seasons usually start, but maybe by like halfway through season three a more seasoned Star Trek writer's room, I think would have gone, crap, I know what we didn't do. We've got this big thing and we need to put it in a person. Yeah. Right. Let's go write Rainer. Well, and they, you know, they had Book, they had Adira, but it still felt like the ship and the crew was so insulated from the, the 32nd century. Well, because, and you even had the Admiral. Because people weren't but, Starfleet. Right. Exactly. But he wasn't on... He was a piece, he was one element of Federation HQ is representing this concept of we have forgotten who we are. Who we are, yep. Right? Uh, and and so he doesn't fill that role. Like and and you're not gonna put him on the crew, right? It's it was brilliant when this writer's room ahead of the season said whatever they did that they create when they created Rainer, I'm hoping a piece of it was uh you know what would really work here is if we take all of this stuff and notice since Rainer's joined the crew, when was the last time we were at Federation HQ? When was the last we time we saw fans anymore. or any of those things? We don't need that for, for Discovery's telling of that story anymore. I miss it. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff happening there. But this is much stronger Trek by, by coalescing that into Rainer. And now mm -hmm. that we have him, we can put that behind us. And I think the right, I, I, I assume, I hope that that's what the writers were doing, that they said that very thing. And they went, let's do this because it, it yep. works. And you're right. I wish it had been here in season three. So speaking of Federation HQ, did you happen to watch the ready room? No, I've not. I, I, I <laughs> went through it faster than I should have. The clip from next week is on Federation HQ. Well, I, so. I miss Saru from a, that character deserves a strong closing for the series, and so I'm hoping that that means we'll get some more Saru footage. The character in the footage is not Saru. No, it is another character. It's somebody we know. It's another okay. character we know that hasn't shown up this season yet, and I'm oh, excited. Interesting. interesting. Mm -hmm. So, let's jump to plot A. Uh, this is over on the Bullseye Planet, which I had to go back and look. It's called Hail No. Um, okay, can, can we go back to the B-plot? Yeah, absolutely. Second? Because the, the, the Colbert story is almost a C-plot. That's fair. And I, I found that the, the telling of that was really important this episode, too. Um... We talk a lot about how Discovery has emotionally strong beats that are frequently don't feel earned. I feel like not just because the actor that plays Colbert is good, and he is, right? He has some real bona fides, and I think he has been a strong performer on this series from the beginning. Oh, yeah. Even in some of the weakest writing, he has always been one of the most important presences um, and that's probably part of the reason why he got off, right? Is the actor could play that, could bring that up a notch, right. even when the writing couldn't. Um, the writing met him, I think, in this week. The one of the things I felt like is emotionally important moments from the opening of the episode with the hologram of his grandmother to his approaching Hugh to all of his inner, uh, not Hugh, I did, I did what you did, Stamets, <laughs> to his approach to all of his interaction with Book was every one of those beats felt real. They felt legitimate and earned to me in a way that Discovery does not. And I think it's because they showed us and they didn't. Agreed. Well, he does not certainly only that. have dialogue. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, not only that, this thing with him, they haven't used the the old trope of of everybody knowing what his thing is except for him. Um, yes. By that I mean the audience. 
I got halfway through this episode, I'm like, I still don't think I understand what in the world is going on with him. What what is the problem? So they haven't made it something that's obvious to the audience, and I yes. really like that that they're leaving they're leaving more unsaid than they are saying, and. I am all in that because it gives him a chance to act that much more mm. and it becomes a, a physicality and, and something that he emotes rather than sets. And yes, he can do that. He's always been able to. Yes. And like, and what an interesting thing to tie it to in terms of the experience he had on Krill, right? This is a yeah. deeply non-human experience. I have a feeling that if an unjoined trill had participated in that instead of him, that they would not have had the same level of impact. Mm -hmm. Right? Even if they were unjoined. And a joined trill, if they would ever participate in that, I don't actually know if they've said, would in particular be like, oh, hey, how you doing? Inside their head, right? right. Nice to meet you. Yeah, cool. Let's do let, let's do this thing. Let's block. This is Jim. Um, this is Bob. Mount Dew's in the fridge. Yeah. Um. So, like a couple of moments that I want to point out. I loved the piece when he forgets to pause Abuela, and then Abuela keeps participating. In, like in Abuela. She doesn't start being like a hologram going, I'm trying to pretend to be your Abuela. She stays as Abuela and does the right thing. And his response is so genuine because at first he's like, what, what? And then he's like, oh crap, you, you're you still Abuela. I don't need to debug you. You're just really being Abuela. Damn, right? <laughs> now my and wife did point out how did she know, how did the hologram know that the real Abuela threw out the food <laughs> and replicated it? <laughs> yeah. I well, think the dude, making that he up. mentioned something about having scanned his memories. Um, well, I wonder if it was pulling brain scans of her. That's a like, long I wonder time if he's importing... ago. Starfleet's a pretty good set of record, record keepers. Yeah. You never know. I, I don't know. I mean, between the burn and every other war. And yeah. Maybe not. Whatever, but honestly, some random Hispanic been, grandmother's brain is well, <laughs> well, that could have been Zora being advanced enough to come up with something to be able yeah. to relate to him, even though she wouldn't have had a, a way to know if it was true. It, and it but, might not be true, right? It might be yeah. the algorithm coming up with something that is consistent with what it knows. Yeah. Anyway. And again, uh, I wish she had appeared two years ago. Because <laughs> it would have been great to, ha to show, because he was showing, I mean, and he, they, they, he actually said that this was part of the, the, uh, the, the trauma programs that they were trying to, yes. to create for the crew yeah. who was getting used to being in the, the 32nd century. So. Yep. And that's something they've been talking about on the down low, kind of. It's, it kind of gets lost in the mix. But Agreed. they've been talking about it since it happened, since they moved, went there. So I loved that moment. I loved the look he gave Book when Book was like, do you ever get tired of always ha of having all the answers? <laughs> that was another one of those things where, and it was the emotiveness. It was the acting, the physical acting. You could see the discomfort the the sense of uh, feeling like he was pulling the wool over book's eyes and he didn't want that kind of relationship right that he wanted to be authentic with him um like it just was a beautiful moment and it comes back in that final scene between them this at the close of the episode right where they have this beautiful dialogue and we get to turn back to book struggle about where is he with Michael, right? Where does he want to be? Where is he and all of that? Um, so I just, they did a master job of showing and not telling. 
that last uh, that last scene of the two of them in the shuttle is one of the reasons that I have a hard time with 10 episode seasons because yes. that, that is the kind of scene that they don't have time to sit and do anymore really? that they yeah. used to be able to and you know and I will just say one final thing on on the C on this C plot and that is there is a moment when Hugh tells but it's still a kind of show because he finally breaks down and tries to tell Stamets what's going on mm. but this is a, a place where for all of their years in partnership and and love and closeness right and very realness to their relationship this is a place where he knows that he can't bridge the gap and so he mm -hmm. just kind of word vomits in a, what is a much more typical kind of writing for discovery but in this moment it's exactly right mm -hmm. because it's what you would do under those circumstances you just tell and go yeah and stamets had one of the two best responses to his experience i think much more so than tilly last week stamets i want to give him all the credit for trying and i think he still offered good advice yeah don't don't tie yourself up in knots in this just revel in it you have been given a gift from the cosmos however you want to assign it in terms of what feels correct in your body for what the source of that is in the cosmos mm -hmm. but regardless don't don't worry about it be thrilled and revel in the gift for however long it lasts and that was the great yang to the yang of of the way that they're handling culver and this whole mystery of what's up with him was such a human and normal and authentic reaction from Stamets, who cannot understand, right. and, he and tries. Yet still manages because of their relationship. And this happens to couples all the time. You 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 have one who can't you can't just relate to what the other's doing, but they still manage to to come up with the right words to say, and they 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 still yes. Help. And, and, oh. and yeah, absolutely. And I don't know that it really landed for Hugh. And I'm sorry for that. I feel like I feel like Stamets was offering a real gift. And I think that just like Hugh couldn't communicate to Stamets, I think Stamets had a hard time hearing what or Hugh was here and having a hard time hearing what Stamets said. There was one other comment by book that I think is also really it touched me anyway. It was something along the lines of there is this very peculiar human quality to feel like something has been lessened yes because it cannot be shared mm -hmm. wait what <laughs> give that to me again book i need like that's some yoda quality zen stuff going on um, <laughs> yep to cross the streams a little bit um <laughs> and I think he has a point. I think he has a point. And it was just interesting. And what a, again, what a very Star Trek thing to do. To take, to offer this, this point of view, lesson if you might even call it that, through the lens of something fantastical that is part of a science fiction framework mm -hmm. right that it would be i think much harder to make it land as impactfully if it didn't have this fantastical otherworldly quality about the experience he's making commentary on so i yes from a store from a plot mechanic standpoint this is the c plot almost assuredly but wow, the impact! And why can't why couldn't Discovery's writers room do this for the last four seasons? Agreed. Agreed. 
Now, on to our next point. I want to just book in that point by saying that the, the A plot, you know that it's that it's that it's a thing. When my 19 year old is sitting watching the trailer last week that they played mm -hmm. and Tilly says, but you can't do that because we can't break the prime directive. And she immediately turned to me and said, they're about to break the prime directive. Yes, I have titled the A plot. Let's break Prime Directive again. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah. She knows Star Trek, but she doesn't know Star Trek that well. And the fact that she, I mean, she just literally, uh, that means they're about to break the Prime Directive, isn't it, Dad? <laughs> yeah. Yes, my dear, you have learned well. Hey, young Padawan, <laughs> or whatever. Star Trek. Uh, so, Burnham and Tilly go and down to the Huh? That would be a cadet. Oh, I thought you mm -hmm. said get out. I was like, well, well no, cadet. Wow. That, would be, out. that would be my cadet. <laughs> so Burnham and Tilly go down to the hell no planet, and they Leroy Jenkins the prime directive while stopping a ceremony key to the identity of the indigenous people. Uh, Jay, you really liked this. I, I want to hear why. So, uh, part of the reason I really like this episode is the other stuff we've talked about. The the showing and not telling and all of that. The coalescing of too many characters into one. This piece, though, this is a story that could have been written in the original series or in The Next Generation in terms of the kinds of content that they would have taken on. So, what we have here is a very classic example. I'm of sorry, Jay. They, yeah. But your pause right after that, all I could hear was a failure to communicate. <laughs> <laughs> and you said, what well, we have yeah. here, and I went, oh, ADHD <laughs> brain engage. <laughs> ADHD <laughs> alert. Whoop. <laughs> what, did you fall through the floor when I wasn't looking? <laughs> <laughs> you did now. You did now. Uh, continue. Thank you. So the prime directive plots wind up one of a few different ways. Um, this is the an example of the kind of story where somebody has already broken the prime directive, but got away with it for a while. In this case, eight hundred years, and they're gone. Right. Um, another example of this would be pen pals from Next Generation. Uh, or and in or the piece of the action is kind of is a variation of this from the original series where somebody accidentally left a book and an entire society pivoted on it like it was the Bible. Um, Even almost a little bit of the Mintakans from Who Watches the Watchers. Yes, another version. Of, those yeah. are all kind of variations of this kind of story where. Something has gone wrong, and the Prime Directive is already out the window to one degree or another. Yeah, that's and how we got the Mormons. It becomes an, a dance of recognize, coming to recognize the degree of damage done, mm -hmm. right? And then deciding how to best rectify it. And frequently that involves pushing the prime director the rest of the way over. If you imagine a domino that's half fallen over but hasn't actually started moving yet and it's stuck, right? Frequently the fix that we wind up seeing captains employ and the who watches the watchers <laughs> is a prime example of that. I'm going to whisk you away to heaven now. Um, and then I'm going to tell you the freaking truth, all of it, and find a way to make two help you see it through the lens of your level of technology and and what your culture sees. So you will stop see? seeing me as a god. See that uh, steamroller over there? <laughs> I... <laughs> We're just going to steamroll right on over the uh, yep. uh, the dominoes. <laughs> because because at some point that becomes like, I, I think that that one, Star Trek teaches us that's probably the thing to do, but I think it makes sense in these contexts. Like it's this recognition of, wait, I'm tiptoeing around this thing when it's already shattered. 
and right. nobody will admit it. It's the uh, emperor's new clothes kind of situation. And that what is required is to acknowledge the truth of the situation. One of our I mean, members- if you think about species, it, the, the Nobleans screwed up. really were the yeah, ones that, no. that did this first. They Yes, that's my point. Like the conversation up on the bridge about, well, they hit it so that they could not break the prime directive. <laughs> no, what they did is they hit it so they wouldn't get caught breaking the prime directive. I thought you were B doing a BS. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's what I heard. That's what I did. Oh, that's the thing. Like, I wasn't sure. The definition of the prime directive is that you won't do anything to affect the cultural, spiritual, economic, or scientific development of a species that is pre-war. Or the physical. And this physical. sure as hell affected all of those things. It did. It did. So the conversation on the bridge, there's, I think that legitimately there are a lot of Starfleet officers until they really have to face the Prime Directive that think that not getting caught is the same as not breaking it. Right? Right. And then you face it. Because, and, I, and so I think that conversation's legit. They did a thing and then they hit it so they wouldn't break the rhyme directive. No, they did this so they wouldn't be caught. But whatever, you'll learn that lesson soon enough. And then they engage with the culture and come to realize, oh, it already broke. These other mm -hmm. people already broke it. Yep. My job is, well, oh. The pilot episode of Strange New Worlds is another one of these stories. Oh, oh sure. Yeah, that's not the, even the like breaking explosion. the prime directive. That is, let's put the ship in front of them. Well, not to be well, fair, no, they didn't because, really have a prime directive yet. But still. well, yeah, but they they still had the Vulcans had instilled this idea of don't mess with pre warp civilizations, yeah. and what had happened was. They discovered warp matter antimatter reactors because there was, during the war, there had been a matter antimatter explosion too close to this planet. Yeah. That was the Strange New Worlds plot. So it was another, the prime directive, nascent or otherwise, is pre broken. But I don't realize that that is the case until I engage with the civilization. And then the captain has to, has to, declare the emperor naked and then deal with the reality that is actually in front of them and almost always the fix for that is to finish the reveal because you do the only partial reveal and you're stuck in wizard of oz you yeah, will yeah. never get away There's from no that sense that. of of godhood unless you finish tearing down the the veils and Burnham played it correctly. And I love how she never once claimed to be a god. She just kept going back to, I'm, I'm, my technology lets me here in the other room. My technology let me appear here. My technology brought me here from across the stars. My technology did this. My team and their technology that they brought with them will save your daughter. Like, oh, she just kept doing, and it's, it's with the Mentakins. It's what the card did, right? Mm -hmm. No, so, not gods. No. Burnham as a character is really good at this because in season two, there's an episode that Frick's directed called New Eden. When they go and find those people that have the whole religious thing around their little Eden society, and mm -hmm. somebody's injured. I want to say it's Anson Mount is injured, and they're taking him like uh, to get yes. him away so they can beam him up. And she looks yeah. at me and says, we need to pray to the gods for their salvation or deliverance or something. And locks them out of the church so they can beam up. So it's the same yeah. situation. And she did a very good yeah. job with that. When at, at one point, she finally does kind of address it when he, he says, well, wait, are you a god? Or, but there's no gods. There's no nothing anymore. And he goes, uh, no. What you believe is what you believe. And we have not changed any of that. And I just, that, I really love the way they handle the whole thing. I think that might have been uh, one of the most masterful plays of the episode and of these kinds of Star Trek stories. Mm -hmm. And I think only Burnham could have done it as a xeno-anthropologist. 
And I will yes. say, I think she handled it better than Picard did. No, well, that's my point. Picard doesn't have that. Picard is an is an archaeologist. archaeologist. Mm -hmm. He right. He deals with artifacts sure. and books. Burnham dealt with people. Well, technically, Burnham dealt with book too, but that's different. <laughs> you know what's really cool is the different styles of captains because Picard, archaeologist, Burnham, xenoanthropologist. Pretty sure Janeway was a science officer. Um, Shaw and Siska were both war veterans. Um, Anson Mount is a diplomat. Like it's it's a very cool I'm scene. Just waiting with for different... Kirk. <laughs> Ladies, Kirk man. is a horror. Um, but for real, he he almost is more of a Cisco um, Shaw, not in the mentality. But in the well, it's the, the last episode of season one of Stanley Well says it, Kirk would have blown him out of the water. Mm -hmm. yep. Um, who we who is Miss Archer? Archer was a diplomat that turned into a war vet. Yeah. No, Archer was an engineer that tried yes. to play diplomat and mm -hmm. failed, and when that happened, was left by circumstances to have to reinvent himself at first very aggressively and then more diplomatically. We get into back to season four and we we see that more diplomatic yeah. side once Earth is no longer in jeopardy. Um, I was watching a YouTube video once on a, on a comparison of different things in pop culture and they took Captain Archer and Walter White and they talked about how they begin their series as basically Mr. Chips. Or Barney, mm. and they transition to Scarface because that moment when Archer's in the nebula and he's like, I'm sorry, I gotta have your engine because my yeah. planet's in trouble. Bye. Yeah. Like, that's a big difference from, okay, I'll take this Klingon across the galaxy. Let's go, boys. Yeah. Like, True. Yeah. But yeah. Um, uh, I also thought this was a lot of good show, not tell. Look at mm. how they how they handled all the stuff with Tilly, both in terms of uh, her struggles with with trying to figure out her role in the academy, especially while on assignment back on Disco, mm -hmm. but also in the race, camera work, acting, all of that. She nailed the mother's role, right mm -hmm. in the story. If you listen to the story be at the beginning of the race. When she at the end of the race shared water, that was what the mother did. Yep. Like, I wanted to jump up and applaud her, both for showing us that she understood the story, right? And uh, as a storytelling mechanism, and for Tilly being the one to figure it out instead of like a Burnham. Mm -hmm. Like, ugh. and when they were dying, like everything that she did in that chamber was show not tell absolutely like tell me something about your mother and all that is a... anyway this was some of the best writing and i say this like two episodes after episode four which was also very strongly written wow agreed where well, was this i love i love that tilly wasn't just back on the ship and just Everything is normal. They they constantly were talking about this isn't her anymore. She's just along for the ride right now. Here's what's really going on, just just like it really would be in in that type of situation. And you're right. Um, I love the subtlety of of the father announcing she has to be disqualified because she no longer has water in her bowl. And then. You, I mean, granted, of course, you know right at that moment Tilly's going to go back and put water in her bowl because there's the loophole. But I, I, I just love the way they, they didn't, they didn't blow all the information right up front. They, they, they gave it as needed. And you're right, that that's a, just another mark of of, of good storytelling. Great. So, I do have a kind of a question about the back end of this, the interaction between Burnham and. Bad dad, or whatever his name is. Um, she says, 
your, your the antenna is going to fail unless it's maintained. I can teach you to maintain it. That to me, so the whole like, let's change the ceremony thing, get our people out of here, is is breaking the prime directive in this the same chain that the Denobi ones began. To me, that's a whole nother step. Is like here's our tech and here's how you're gonna keep it going. Cause she is kind of saying your whole society that's based around this thing. Here's the wrench that makes it work. Like, here's the holy wrench. Needed. That that was needed to help them preserve their race because now they they will have the knowledge so that they won't assume that this was a bunch of gods that came from the sky and then disappeared. And it won't throw their civilization into chaos because they're they're going to have the tools. I can help you keep it going. So, so yes. And Jake, here's the thing: the prime directive was run over roughshod 800 years ago by the Denobi scientists, right? And whoever worked for him, like the conspiracy, if you were going to charge this like would be hundreds of people, hundreds of Denobulans long, okay? We get to the present, and now we are left with a situation of, you literally have to decide, do you kill all these people through an act of omission, but you are legitimately doing the equivalent of taking a phaser out and murdering every single individual in this society while you're here, morally, or do you not to do that and again this is an ethical dilemma related to bro already broken prime directive moments. right and invariably the other piece of starfleet is that discover strange new worlds right and right. meet new civilizations i don't know a single starfleet captain that is one that we have focused our attention on I grant you there's probably plenty that we can <laughs> serve. These are the ones that are held up as heroic <laughs> figures Lorca. to learn from. Not Starfleet. 100% <laughs> agree. Right? Um, who wouldn't choose life over death as the consequence for our collective failure of in the Federation to enforce our own laws. Agree. Mm -hmm. And so what you are... We did this with pen pals. We saved them. We, When Worf's brother broke the prime directive uh, with the society he was with and beamed all of the, that village up on the planet that was doomed because he was a cultural anthropologist that got too close and actually got married to one of them. It was like, I'm not going to let my wife and unborn child die because of the fucking prime directive. You have to bleep me out. I'm sorry. Um, but that's how he felt, I'm sure. Um Again, Picard chose life. He's like New Eden. New they Eden. chose yeah. to move the All asteroid. These, right? All of the what happens is somebody else committed a crime. I will not punish you for it. Right. This is no longer natural evolution, but that ended when somebody else committed a crime. And that is the difference between what Worf's brother did, right? What the Denobulans did. And what Picard did, and what uh, Michael did, right? And Great. so, yeah, I imagine it. It isn't spoken, uh, but I imagine that while the dots were down there, that they fixed the other towers, mm -hmm. so that um, this planet will be slowly reborn, and the society will understand the maintenance of the towers because they're all the same. And that if we were to come back in 80 years in Discovery the Next Generation, uh, that we would and revisit this planet, that we would find a thriving ecosystem and a society that has grown by a factor of 10 or more because mm -hmm. they're not hemmed in. Now, yeah. the rest of the question is, what are the other consequences, right? And you could have a field day writing that story, either in terms of, Let's go back to the law of un unintended consequences, or let's go to a place where they are mo progressing at a reasonable rate through cultural and technological evolution. And somebody ends the episode by going, "Come back in another, you know, two centuries, and these guys are going to have warp drive." 
Yeah. So that's, I think, how that works and why it is always the answer. We don't ever see someone punish those that the prime directive was broken in their, you know, against, so to speak, for the fact that somebody broke it. This other person broke the prime directive. You know what I would think would be a great thought experiment? Mm -hmm. Earth is a pre-warp civilization. Absolutely. I would like to sit down and identify the times we think that Starfleet might have broken the Prime Directive in our case. <laughs> I'm just saying, well, I know so certain people. <laughs> so what? maybe not, maybe not Starfleet, unless it's the temporal Prime Directive. But we know, even in canon now, it used to be a lot in the equivalent of Legends that was very talked about in the books. But thanks to Enterprise, it is canon that for centuries, like dating back to the 20th century, the Vulcans were observing Earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And we know of at least one time that the Vulcans violated their non-interference directive. Because to Paul's grandmother, I think it was, um, sold the IP to Velcro. Yep. In order to pay for something <laughs> she needed. Yeah, I remember that. That's so weird. And they had amazing taste. They watched uh, I Love Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, reference to Desilu. Um, mm -hmm. Little, little right. nod to, uh, to, to parent, to, to Star Trek's grandmother. Mm -hmm. Thank so, you, Lucille Ball. 100%. Um, so guys, this has been a good episode. Let's go ahead and get our final thoughts. Uh, John, let's get your final thoughts on this episode. It, it was, it was an amazing episode to sit and watch. The acting was really there. It, you can tell everybody knows that things are winding down and they are giving 110% mm -hmm. in every moment that they're on the screen. Um, yeah, except for they didn't. Look at the interviews with Burnham with uh, the uh, what's her what's her name that plays Burnham Green. Um, so equal Martin Green. They did Martin Green. Yeah, they didn't know. Yeah, that's true. They went. They had to do this. In, they they had to that's do the true. wrap up part in post. You know, they probably it was more probably that they were hitting their stride and they're feeling yes. Hey, this is awesome, and we're going to be going for three more years. Mm -hmm. Whoops. All we can yeah. hope for is that Paramount goes. And sells this IP, and then maybe somebody picks Discovery up for another couple of seasons. Mm, that would. So Skydance's uh, 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 the 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 window of opportunity of exclusivity for Skydance is um, is ticking very quickly, and mm -hmm. apparently, uh, two of the other uh, bidders or or interested parties, Sony and Apollo have now joined forces to uh, oh. publicly say that they're going to go in on it together. I don't want Sony to touch this. No, Sony, I don't either. No. Sony screws up no. every single thing they touch. Yeah. Jay, it's... final thoughts on this episode before I go on a 25-minute rant about Sony and their Sony Pictures Universe of Marvel characters, or Spumka. Well, and think about it. Sony and... It's not a, the only uh... one. And and I'm just... I'm, I, will, I will help put a pause to that because it will turn into a 45 minute episode of at least you and I complaining about Sony because Marvel is just one example 100%. and it's absolutely the film arm of Sony. Yeah, the other parts of Sony, different story. Um, yeah, but do we want more Star Trek into darkness? No, that's my point. Like, please don't let Sony be the one that picks this up. Um, excuse me. In terms of this episode, like I said, this might have been one of the most Star Trek episodes that Discovery has Star Trek. And I'm there for it. And I am sorry that it... I am reminded of Enterprise. Enterprise was the first series um, that I was... that I ranted as much about as I rant about much of New Trek. Um, because I feel that the first three seasons were wasted. Um, I was about to say that. <laughs> they got to number four, and they were and then, killing it. 
And that was a different story. They knew, my understanding is they knew they had been canceled, but it was, they had committed to filming. So they went ahead and did it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a different story of what happened there. Oh yeah. I don't know. I, I extrapolate. But I am starting mm-hmm. a little less so with last week's episode, but with four and six in particular, I'm starting to come to a similar place I was with Enterprise about midway, about, as it turned out, midway through season four going, I was at the beginning of the season perfectly fine with this show wrapping up. It never found its stride. It went to very strange places for Star Trek that in many ways didn't feel very Star Trek. It's the same kind of thing. It's how do you, t- I think the writer's room didn't know how to tell Star Trek stories in that era. And uh, much like I think this writer's room had a challenge with trying to figure out how to tell Star Trek stories, both in our present day and the era they were originally set. And here I am about midway, like I was midway through season four going, if I had known we were going to get this, I would yeah. have been pissed about this being the last that we get of this crew. 100%. Because, wow, I finally feel like I did in season four connected to that crew. I feel connected to the stories. I feel like I am watching Star Trek and it's still fresh. And I think that's been one of the things other commenters have said it like, but Discovery's fresh can be fresh and and star trek and i don't think we've had that until now and i think enterprise had the same challenge Mm -hmm. and so yeah my takeaway is wow and thank you for making me sad that this series is winding down at this point Mm -hmm. agreed Mm -hmm. um i like this episode i I agree with you jay i mean again i felt it was an odd pace change for the rest of the season but it was a good star trek episode i mean after this episode am i glad discovery is ending hell um, no but i get it paramount's the only thing i will say is (laughs) it's gonna keep my interest in in 32nd century oh 100 percent star trek i can't wait even though academy even though academy is supposed to be more of a teen show than a, a, an adult show. Yes. Um, but it could be one that, you know, if they handle it properly, you know, they've got, they got a, a big enough playground. They've got some space to play. They There's some stories to tell. Well, and that, and real quick, Jake, um, I think that in response to what you were saying, the the pacing piece is, goes back to the business about ten. Star Trek stories don't fit in 10 episode seasons. 100%. And so we get this Star Trek story and Unless your last name is Picard. feels misplaced. Right? Well, and even then, I think if you go back and watch our reviews, we made some comments about some of the way that the third season in particular worked that was working well and felt more Trek. But also, like pacing was weird because of 10 episodes right star trek comes from the star trek formula for the kind of story you tell is a much longer breed story even when it's serial even when it's serial looking at you deep space nine looking at pieces Mm -hmm. of voyager right Mm -hmm. um and so i think that that pacing thing comes back to you got a Star Trek story in a thing that was crammed into 10 episodes. And of course it feels weird because it doesn't belong crammed in the middle of 10 episodes. Yep. And then I, if you want to wave a magic wand, if you want to dream, if you want to say this writer's room gets it enough, the discovery deserves another couple of seasons. What's to say that Academy comes or that Star Trek is bought by someone sensible and who understands how to invest in the stories that need to, that are to be told in this universe. Academy happens during their ownership and they backdoor pilot more discovery by having Burnham and crew come back to headquarters. 
Agreed. And something with the Academy crew interacts with something that Discovery has been doing off camera to test the waters for more discovery. We still have what we need in order to have from a fan base, from a writer's room, from an actor availability, all of that. More discovery secrets. Yeah, I agree. I think really the only ones you need to worry about are Culper, Stamets, Book, and Burnham, and Rainer. Uh, and Rainer. They keep now swapping Rainer. out the bridge officers like they're Russian dolls, so. Yeah. Um, Hell, you could even like do the spinoff part of it from the from a graduating class where we get a couple of ensigns who get assigned to Discovery. No, 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 no. The new Academy ship needs to be the ISS Enterprise. That would be pretty, pretty cool. That saves money on <laughs> sets. Oh, and I need this in my life now. To, you what? It, it, very callback to the motion picture film era. Yes. The mm -hmm. film era, right? Where after the motion picture, NCC 1701, refit, but still no bloody A, B, C, or D, becomes uh, an academy training vessel. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but imagine a graduating class having a couple of ensigns that we followed for like two or three years. Yeah get assigned to the front seats, the two front seats on the disco. As a backdoor, as part of the backdoor pilot. Discovery had come by a couple of times. We've tested the waters. We get all the contracts back in place. And then to have that continuity, like bringing O'Brien to Deep Space Nine, like launching Voyager's first episode from, you know, in the, at, in the Badlands mm -hmm. and stopping by Deep Space Nine, right? We take two of the more senior uh, cadets and they graduate and they wind up the front seats so that we see we have we start to build that continuity between series again. That was part of the legacy era. Yes. And now I'll stop. I got it. All right, folks. Well, that was our review of Star Trek Discovery Episode 6 Season 5. Whistle speak. That took a second. I apologize. <laughs> Next week is Araga. So I think we're going to dive into some uh, blood bounty breen fun. Say that three times fast. Uh, from all of us here at the Nerd Network and Section Nerdy One in particular, we hope you like, subscribe, and join our family because we love stalking. Stalking? We love stalking Star Trek. Um, we do, but do. not in a weird way. So, you know, no reporting. We love talking Star Trek too. So if you'd like to leave a comment, we would love to engage with you and get all nerdy about everything we love. But John, where can they find you, sir? Uh, here. <laughs> At an no, undisclosed I'm, uh, location on his back porch. The <laughs> now they're going to find me, dang it. <laughs> uh, no, you know, uh, the John the Nerd on uh, uh, X and and other places um, and, and here. So, <laughs> hey Jay, uh, around various parts of the Nerd Network, including Section Nerdy One, of course, and the Nerd Republic, because I roll all things that start with star or have star in the name as a science fiction dude uh, and overall nerd. And then, of course, you can find me on my website, thejsimmons.com. J is just a letter like it is in the name plate below. And I am the Jake the Nerd on Twitter, Twitter Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. And Obviously, I'm here, too. I'm in all the things, because it's my life. Uh, have fun, folks. We will see you next time.